Welcome to the Mind Vine Podcast, where we challenge the stigma associated with mental illness through conversations about a variety of issues impacting mental health. Here we bring you news, views, and interviews that intrigue, educate, and celebrate recovery. Leading us on this journey are the hosts of the Mind Vine Podcast, Daryl Mathers and Chris Bovey. Welcome to the Mind Vine Podcast. My name is Daryl Mathers. I'm with my co-host as usual, Chris Bovey. Chris, how are you? Good. How are you doing, Daryl? Well, same, right? It's the last 14 months of doing the podcast, but um, I think this is kind of like unique in a in a in a way, as opposed to last year. At this time, we were in the midst of the pandemic and trying to figure out all the like the physical health. Um, challenges that were going to be in front of us and social as we approached mental health week. And this year, this podcast, we're going to exclusively talk about mental health week or mental health issues related to mental health week. And I think there will be more of a focus this year on, on actual mental health and maybe the impact of the pandemic and, and all the different challenges that we've faced over the last year. Yeah. And I think this is a topic probably you and I are glad to kind of have a chance as, as dads, you know, and dealing with, with the, the challenges of mental health and adolescence and all, you know, and young people and the challenges that, that we're kind of trying to navigate and learn on the fly. So i um, excited about today's topic. Yeah. So perfect segue. So we're going to, we're going to talk to Dr. Nadia Duso, who I'm going to bring in right now. Oh, welcome. Hi. Hi. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Dr. My pleasure. Obviously, you work with our adolescent program. You're a psychologist on Ontario Shores. And um, I think, like, as Chris alluded to, as, as parents, um, you know, this is kind of a timely topic. We're going to talk youth mental health, um, you know, for the duration of the podcast. And I know as a parent, there's lots of times, or even with my own uh, health and mental health, I think I wish I could talk to a psychologist about this. And so that's what we're going to that's what we're going to do uh, today. And maybe we can just start, um, you know, in what you see at the hospital in your private practice and your different professional experience. Like, what are some of the challenges, you know, facing young people in terms of their mental health today? I think that, you know, I don't think I've ever felt so, so busy. Like in, in terms of the mental health piece, I would say with the adolescents specifically, a lot of their world just changed very quickly last March schools closed, you know, they were out of their extracurricular activities. They weren't able to see friends. They weren't able to see family and it never really regained that momentum for them. And so they've had to learn how to, you know, do online schooling. They've had to learn how to be okay with just zoom calls with people that they're really happy to see every day. So I think in terms of mental health, it's added a lot of stress. And so sometimes I'm seeing that whatever vulnerabilities went into this pandemic has just heightened and become a lot more stressful. I was thinking a little bit, you know, before this, uh, before today, remember you and I going to Whitby Shore School and how- I remember that, yeah. And, and I, it, was, it was funny because the topic was about, you know, should kids be on their devices and, and their mental health? And some parents, like, I don't let them have a, a laptop or a computer. And here we are now where- that's the norm of every day. So I'm just wondering on the flip side, you know, now kids are on their devices almost all the time and not having the social. So I'm curious your, your perspective on how we find balance and ensure that um, they have healthy habits when it comes to online, which is taking up so much of their day. You know, it's interesting because when, when they were in school, they didn't have access to their devices and it was so incredible for them to finally get home and use their devices or be on the bus and use their devices. But now I'm seeing the opposite. Now that they're on their devices all day, they want nothing to do with their devices at night. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's almost like a flip. And a lot of adolescents that I talk to find it really hard because it's like how they now are expected to not only do schoolwork, but maintain relationships, right? Like maintain their peers' relationships, maintain family relationships. And so it's become something that is less appealing overall, which in some ways is good, but it adds a bit of stress on those relationships. Like when we think about mood and anxiety, you know, social anxiety is higher because now you're not 
as comfortable interacting with people every day. Now you're doing it online, right? And now mood is also a big challenge because you're feeling more isolated. And especially during the winter months, there was a huge wave of, I was seeing a lot of adolescents just struggling to find connection. So I think in terms of creating that healthy balance, it's looking at a bit of that dialectical behavioral model I talk about quite a bit with the teens here, even that radical acceptance. So for right now, we're not going to make rules about what this can look like even in a week from now, but day to day, what do you have control of? How can you support yourself in the ways that are safe? Does that mean that you go for walks? Does that mean that you spend more time with mom and dad outdoors? Does it mean that Maybe there is ways of creating a bit of social distancing where you can still see some of the people that are important to you. It depends on where we are in terms of the waves and where we are in terms of the guidelines, but it's looking at how to gain some control every day. It's a very present focused approach and a very much more of a behavioral approach, I would say, because it's it's constantly moving. Even for us as adults, we can't make predictions and we can't make promises, but day to day, what can they do? to get back to some of their basic functioning, you know, walks outside, seeing some people. Um, and I'm even pushing, I hear myself pushing sometimes Zoom connections and seeing that that is something that they don't have to accept forever. But for right now, if they need support, that's what they can do. So it's all about creating a bit of a balance. As a parent, I think we're always watching our kids. Um, we not, might not be able to see everything, um, but we're always trying to. I think we're looking at them, seeing what they're, doing in school and with their friends or whatever the case may be. Um, what are some of the things that we need to be looking for as parents uh, with our kids today? Like are there, are there behaviors, are there symptoms, are, are there, you know, issues that we can name that we should be looking at? Like how should we be looking at our kids today? I think that some of the things that come up in terms of the academic piece, or even just because of how school has dramatically changed, where there's no in-person learning or very little in-person learning, and um, there's also very little extracurricular activities. What I'm noticing is a bit of a decrease sometimes in motivation or drive to do the work. Like I'm seeing a bit of that, even if they're not struggling with mood, there's a bit of that, I don't know, it just feels like every day feels the same type of effect. Um, so it's looking at how to, you know, develop a daily routine, how to help them develop some type of schedule that gets them up close enough to when their school date starts or close enough to what they would be doing in school to maintain a bit of regularity. Like I really think about wake up times. I think about intake in terms of food and just making sure that they're keeping their bodies healthy, but also keeping a close eye on what they're doing online. Like, are they, are they Zoom turning and tuning into their classes? Is the work getting done? Because I think I'm seeing a little bit of that, you know, procrastination or pile up and, and not feeling that motivation. Like, what's the point? I have all this time. No one's going to care if I'm online or not. So there's less of that in-person accountability. So sometimes I encourage parents to, make it so that they have a bit of eyes on in terms of just how the day is rolling out if they can. Yeah. I mean, those are good points. I know, you know, sort of more normal routine than they used to have in school. Like sometimes the kids will be like staying in their pajamas or not doing the things and it becomes sort of a uh, repetitive. I was wondering as far as um, you talked a little bit about, you know, the growth of young people, like I always feel like school is not just about academics. It's the time where you learn how to interact with people, as you mentioned. It's, you know, there's so many special moments that kids are leaving, losing out on, whether it's their graduations or things that are proms and such. I'm just wondering about the whole totality, so, it's, so the total picture, and, um, you know, the concern of, of not having those things of, that are great importance in one's life not available to them. Yeah, that's something that I'm hearing a lot about as well. Like, you know, some of the earlier, like last summer, there were some of the, my clients in the community that missed out on prom, right? Or even clients in the hospital that weren't able, like we used in our hospital, we used to have, you know, community passes. So if you had a big event that you had, that you were a part of, you could go. And now even here, we're noticing that we can't let kids leave, right? So they're not able to be in the community. They're not able to transition home in any way that feels normal or more natural, um, so I think that sometimes, you know, with one of my clients, even in hospital, I encourage mom and dad to think about, you know, when the pandemic lifts or when it's safe again, how do we recreate that moment? 
it may not be exactly the same, but let's really try to hit those milestones. If it was a prom that they missed, how do we recreate maybe a backyard experience when it's safe? You know, bring her to get her dress, get her excited, do the hair and makeup that you would have done that day and, and kind of redo it. Like I want to, I'm really encouraging parents to kind of pay attention to where the milestones are and what was coming up for them and seeing if there are ways of doing it, even if it's outside of the time frame and not exactly in the same way, but we want to validate and encourage that, that work towards still, like, even though they can't graduate and have a big party, it's important that they graduate because they'll get something after right. like a little bit of that reinforcement piece coming in. But it's, it's challenging. It's super challenging. I worry about, you know, I worry about the physical health, but I also worry about the mental health. And a lot of people are just struggling day to day with knowing how to how to feel normal. Yeah. And as we try to help young people, I mean, adults are struggling too. you know, with the, maybe not the same type of milestones that they're missing out on. But obviously, like their life has been thrown upside down, too. And we're all just kind of trying to get through this in the best way we can. I wonder, you know, you, th- you talk about like generations, right? Like how we like evolution of relationships over, over time. And obviously how our, my grandparents uh, raised their kids a lot different than how my parents raised their kids and so on. And for some people, we didn't grow up talking about uh, different emotions and uh, how we felt about missing certain things or being able to articulate having those conversations. And so I wonder if you have any advice for parents who might be trying to engage with their young person, whether they're a preteen or a teenager or whatever the case may be, that may not come from a place where it's easy to have those conversations. Like what, what can they do to kind of get the ball rolling? Well, I think one of the first things I think about and when I've had conversations with parents is just also be mindful of your own mental health. Like just be mindful that you're taking care of you in this process. I know a lot of parents that are working from home are also working with their kids working from home and your day has also been very, has also changed. And so just being mindful that, you know, kids can pick up on things that are changing for you too. And like, you might feel as a parent, maybe a little less patient, maybe you're feeling a bit more anxious, like just being mindful of how you're experiencing some of these changes. And sometimes I've encouraged parents, you know, to think about what they feel comfortable sharing as a way of opening it and validating that, that they, that you two are struggling, you know, like maybe you're struggling with feeling overwhelmed because you're trying to navigate working from home. And that's an experience that they can join with because they're struggling to navigate working from school from home and, and just showing them in some ways or opening up by sharing a little bit about your experiences and that you can understand how they too might be feeling anxious or they too might be missing their friends. And, and that could help kind of validate and normalize it. That it's not just them, that you're also experiencing things or you're also aware that these are going to be hard moments for them. And I would open it up and ask what they think they need more of. Like sometimes kids are pretty good about naming what they need and what they think could help. And having a conversation around what we can make as changes, given the restrictions, given the guidelines, you'd be surprised at the things that I've heard, the very creative ideas of how to see their friends or how to, you know, safely make a bit more of a connection. Um, And then it could be an open dialogue around maybe some coping as well. On the flip side, you know, what about for teens or adolescents? So, you know, unfortunately, not everybody has a great home life and, and there may be trauma in the household or issues that they're dealing with. And now they don't even have school to sort of escape that. They're in their home environment all the time. What do you recommend for a young person that, you know, maybe their parents lost their jobs or there, there's some things and they don't really have a the same sort of channels or connections at home to get help. What do you recommend that they can do for themselves? So hard. Eh? That's the hardest part is, you know, the assumption is that everyone's working and everyone's healthy, but it's not necessarily the case. And um, I would say, you know, to reach out to someone that they trust, it could be a teacher, it could be a school counselor. I think schools are still offering some virtual support, and that could be an important avenue to get some outside help. Um, because, you know, if mom and dad are not able to provide it, then you know, a school counselor, a trusted teacher, a trusted mentor um, could be helpful in at least connecting a teen with someone outside of their home for a more supportive 
um, a more supportive approach. Absolutely. But teachers, mentors, coaches, someone that they trust, um, that they could spend some time and just talk a little bit about maybe what a need is coming up for them is. In your, yeah, I would say early intervention as much as possible. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, early intervention, maybe you can speak just to early intervention in, in general when it comes to mental health issues, um, right? So some, you know, if we kind of park the virtual school just for a few moments, just to think about um, maybe our son or daughter is exhibiting symptoms um, of a potential mental illness or certainly a mental health issue. How important is it that as parents that we recognize it and act as soon as possible? It's very important. It's actually crucial. The early intervention is probably the best p- approach only because, you know, none of us really know when this is going to change. I mean, there's some promising steps. There are vaccines. There are things that are in place to, we hope, change a little bit of what we're experiencing, but there's no guarantees that this is going to lift within the next year. And so, um, what I would say is because of the consistent stress that it's been placing on mental health since last year, any signs that your child is exhibiting, you know, changes in their mood, changes in their anxiety, you're starting to notice their sleep is a bit shifted. So now they're staying up later, sleeping later, their eating is started to shift, either they're eating more or they're restricting. You're starting to notice some behaviors that are maybe a bit obsessive or like, I I see that there's a lot of ways that adolescents are trying to regain some control and it may not be in healthy ways. And so if you as parents start to see these shifts from baseline or, or changes, I would say early intervention is the most appropriate or most effective way to nip it in the butt as soon as you can. Is that something you see with with parents a lot is that they focus on the negative behavior as the issue and not the underlying? Like, is that normal for parents to look and say, you know, whether they're you catch them with um, edibles or 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 they're drinking or they have some destructive behaviors and you focus on the behavior and not take the time to understand what's under the surface or why they're using that as a coping strategy? Is that is that a common thing among parents? It, it really is. Yeah. Like I think parents look at the behavior sometimes and sometimes the behaviors are really upsetting or scary. And so you focus on that piece. Um, and as parents, that's normal. I, I don't think parents are trained in mental health. They're not necessarily trained to understand. There's even an underlying part to that. Um, but if you start to notice these behaviors, then it's about looking at connecting with someone who can help your child or adolescent get to the underlying pieces Um, so for instance, you know, um, even if clients I've worked with in the past, haven't had a history of eating disorders or haven't had any problems with eating, I'm starting to notice that they're, they're coming up. Like maybe there were some vulnerabilities in the past, but now that everything has changed for them and they can't exercise and they can't be active or they can't do the things that make them feel good in their bodies. They start to change how they're eating. It might be very slow. It might be very you know, very gradual, but it can become a thing very quickly. So mm-hmm. early intervention. I love the emails I get with, I'm not concerned yet, but <laughs> dot, 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 dot. <laughs> I'm like, perfect. That's the perfect timing. <laughs> As a mom and dad, you have that instinct and you're like, it's good to just check it. And then a professional can tell you. Sarah, is there, I think back to my own, you know, you know Often we always think back to our own experiences, um, especially when we're talking about our children and, and uh, you know, balancing that with, you know, the education and, and what we know about the world today. But I think about, you know, like some of the maybe the issues that friends have when I was growing up and how I couldn't even I was not equipped to handle any of those really tough conversations. If, I, if somebody was struggling or if somebody was destructive behavior or if I was the one doing that and uh, like we weren't equipped to have those real tough conversations. And I wonder like in today's world, is there, you know, for a teen or for a young person, like, is there a role for their friends to play in terms of these conversations and identifying behaviors? You know, in the past, I would have said peer support, validating important, and it still is, but I just worry about that a little bit more now because I think that a lot more, because this is a common stressor that everyone's experiencing, it's something that unites us all, adults, adolescents, babies, children, doesn't matter. I would 
I would be cautious around friends doing too much of that support because they're also in need of support. It's not a stressor. It's not something that they're not experiencing as well. So what I'm very mindful and what I hear myself sometimes telling my adolescent clients is we have to be very careful because emotions can accumulate, even if they're not yours, even if they're not about the same thing. But if you're feeling unwell and then you're hearing a lot of other friends feeling unwell and you don't know what to do with those feelings, then it becomes added to how you feel. It adds on to how you might be experiencing your anxiety, your sadness, your hopelessness. Um, So I think I would encourage peers to still, of course, you know, if they're hearing something that's concerning to them, I would encourage them to go to mom and dad and kind of share what their concerns are or share that their, their friend might be in need of help. But I would very much not recommend that adolescents get in the role of helping each other through this in terms of a mental health perspective. I mean, if they have like little things like their boyfriend did this or their girlfriend did that and they're frustrated, like the common adolescent like quirks. But when it comes to the heavier pieces, I'm just very mindful of that additive effect of emotions that we as adults have a better way of channeling. But as adolescents, it's a bit of a learned skill. Does that make, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure it does. Yeah. Yeah, well, I wonder, you know, if there's things as parents, we, you know, and adults, we should be cognizant of that we're our own behaviors and, and you know, kids are watching all the time. One thing I always, um, I see a lot is, you know, people are afraid to be authentic. So on social media, and, you know, I see kids do this, but I even see us as adults, we want, it's almost like our brand. We want to have the, the perfect family photo. Everything looks perfect. Nobody fights, nobody does anything. And then the kids kind of see that these images that, they feel like they have to live up to this fake kind of persona. Yeah. And I'm wondering, is that something that they learn from parents or things that we should be cognizant of or signals that we're putting out there for young people about, you know, being authentic or being truthful to themselves? Do you mean as parents in terms of like how you manage? How we operate, words that we use or the things that we should be cognizant of that, that might impact our, you know, young people that we just need to pause and think a little bit about. Yeah, I think that, you know, depending on the family, depending on the stressors in the family, there have been some changes everywhere. And I do I do I do think that social media still poses a bit of a challenge because people are still posting. They're still active on social media and a lot of what they post. And I hear myself saying this as well. It's probably their best moments that like one little snapshot of like a week. That's like their best time, their best smile, their best outfit, their best hair. But when you're struggling, you see that and you're like, huh, that's still the standard I have to live up to. But it's so much more impossible now. And I don't I can't do anything about a lot of the things that I'm struggling with. So I've always said, you know, as parents still very much being being mindful of social media, being mindful of the effects of social media and also within yourself, being mindful of, you know, how you're coping with some of the stress that you might be experiencing because you're all in the home together a lot of the times, right? So kids hear their parents getting super frustrated. Kids hear some of the things that are happening that there was a bit of a separation of from before. Um, So if, if, if you as a mom and dad are having a hard time or a hard day, sometimes it's important to just be mindful that your kids are probably very aware of that more so than they've been in the past. Um, so seeing how you can introduce your own coping, but also seeing how much of it you can share and, and help and, and being a bit transparent if you are, you know, having a hard day or something's coming up for you that's stressful. Mm-hmm. Like the social media piece is one that I <clears throat> struggle with and it's um, not, I guess it's unique to the child in, in our case. Anyways, we have, a, we have a daughter who's really into social media. She wants every social media account that <laughs> is out there, <laughs> right? She wants it now. She wants to post all the time. And uh, I, I would say my wife and I, like, we have uh, differing views on it, right? I think my wife could take or leave social media. I use it for work. And I also I get some personal, you know, enjoyment out of using it as well. Like, there's some value in it for me. And, uh, but I also, like, I guess I struggle with, I get that she's vulnerable on social media, but she also has to learn how to use it responsibly um, moving forward. If she's kind of the personality that would, would see value. And I guess it's a, it's just a struggle. I, I guess I'm not, I don't think I'm alone either because I see some of her friends that have accounts and some that don't. So it's like, 
it's a real tug of war sometimes. But like we may not like how the world is, but yes, we kind of have to relent a little bit because that is the way the world is. And she like they have to learn to use some of these things responsibly. I don't know if that is, uh, yeah. is something that people struggle with, but like in our own home, it's it's a conversation we have on a regular basis. Yeah, absolutely. Especially now that they're at home with their phones right beside their computers and they're doing schoolwork and they're getting texts or they're getting messages or they're on their Instagram. Like it's right now, it's just a part of their world because it is virtual. And they are at home and they have access to everything. Yeah. So there's no necessary break. Hmm. Uh, but I don't think anything is a problem unless it starts to become a problem. Meaning like if you start to notice changes or you start to notice the impact and then maybe it's more of a course of action, but some, some adolescents use social media and it doesn't impact them or it doesn't impact them as much as other adolescents. So it really also depends on what they're affected by. You know, well, and some, yeah. go, no, ahead. go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. And like on, on the other side, like some adolescents that have struggled with school or school bullying or school experiences that have been hard. You know, I also want to point out that some are actually doing better with the work from home because now they're not feeling as, um, you know, un, unwelcomed by their peers, or if there are things that have been happening in the school setting that have been stressful, this has also provided them with a bit of a reset. So I just wanted to, so it's not, it doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. It just really depends on how they're experiencing it. Mm-hmm. So it's an individual approach too. Yeah. Well, I, there's no shortage of challenges raising there's kids. There's no shortage of challenges. <laughs> and there's no shortage of challenges. Yeah. If you want to hang back, Daryl, you can explain TikTok to me later when we're Yeah. Done. Well that's yeah TikTok is <laughs> TikTok is is constantly in the vocabulary of my nine year old. Like she just wants TikTok all the time. And, uh, and other things as well. And it's like, it is, it is, I mean, it's a small, it seems like a small thing, but to your point earlier, um, you see the, the cherry picking of our lives. And I know I've talked to uh, patients before who say that social media has actually like, they had issues maybe with anxiety and depression before, but like social media, when they had a child, for example, um, really did some damage to them because they saw these people that were so happy to be parents and like going to the parks and like all this other stuff. And like, they didn't feel that way in the early days of their, you know, of their role as a, as a parent. So I'm mindful of that thing, those things too, but it's, you know, it's a mess. Like it's something that we have to navigate, but it's, it's not easy. No, definitely not. But is there anything, um, maybe my last question would be, um, is there anything that maybe you're seeing or something that you've seen in the past, like any like advice or like maybe generally you give to parents, you know, when it comes to, to youth mental health that we haven't covered? No, I think that it's such a, it's such a, it's such a challenging time um, for our youth. I see it in the hospital. I see it in the community. Um, and it's a challenging time for adults and it's a challenging time for children. Like even toddlers are having a hard time not understanding why their playground is closed. So everyone's kind of struggling with similar types of questions. Um, I think with the adolescent piece, it's really about communication as much as you can in the home, like really starting to ask the questions around how they're doing, how they're feeling, talking about the daily stressors that could be coming up as much as you can and also engaging in in any way that you can that normalizes their their life. So if it's about being outside together in a safe way, if it's about, you know, you you may as parents have to motivate and push a little bit depending on what's what's happening Uh, and, and being watchful and mindful of any changes in behaviors that you see, any changes in their functioning, any things that feel like when that little spidey sense as a mom and dad comes up and you're like, huh, you don't know what it is, but it just doesn't feel like it, it typically felt before. And there's something different about your child. I would just reach out. You don't even have to have the child reach out. You can just reach out to a, a counselor, reach out to a practice that you feel comfortable with and just ask the question. Sometimes parents just ask me the question and they're like, should I be worried? And, you know, and sometimes I can, even with a five or 10 minute consultation, I can say, why don't we have a sit down with your daughter or your son and just have an initial kind of look in. It doesn't have, you don't have to commit to anything, but it can just be a look in. And sometimes kids find it helpful to have someone outside of mom and dad to talk about, you know, without it being a diagnosis or a mental health issue, but just the day-to-day stress that comes with 
not being able to swim, not being able to play soccer, not being able to get a break from being at home or not being able to be at school and ask their teacher questions. Like the little things that they took for granted are now huge. They see the importance of it, right? Um, So I would say don't hesitate, don't ponder. If you have questions, even if a lot of the outpatient supports right now have wait lists and wait times, everyone's open to having 10 minute consultations. I shouldn't say everyone, but a lot of clinicians are open to having like short consultations, check-ins and, and put yourself on a wait list. Even if you're having to wait a little bit, it's better to, to be proactive than to have a, a moment that you see a lot has happened. And then you have to start at that pace, like start when the functioning is good. If you can. That's a great point. Like we go and get physical checkups, even when we're not unwell, yeah. but we, we wait, we don't do that for mental health. We tend to wait no. for an issue. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm noticing that like in this trend, you know, in working with adolescents in the community before the pandemic, even 15 or 16 year olds would email me directly and they would just be like super in, and I could see parents were in the background, but they would just take that lead. But now I'm getting a lot more parents that are checking in with me first. And they're saying things like, I don't know, like, but, or I'm seeing this and, and, and it's, and they're like, can we just talk for like five minutes? And I do. And I'm like, okay, so let's, you know, even in 10 minutes, I can get a sense um, that maybe an appointment could be helpful. And then they can go on my wait list. And if it comes up and they don't need me anymore, no harm. If it comes up and they need me, at least they have something there. Hmm. Great. Well, that's great information. Great advice. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to oh, my join pleasure. us today. And, and I know when, when it comes to Mental Health Week, obviously um, the development of our young people is of great interest to a lot of people. So thank you for, for shedding some light. And uh, this is your second time on our podcast. You're on, <laughs> you're on for 13 Reasons Why. And we'll I remember. talk about that. So uh, you're one of the few, select few with multiple appearances. So thank you for, uh, for joining us today. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me. And um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak about adolescent mental health. And and it was a good opportunity to share a little bit of my insights. Thank you.